Hi. Um, so I'm Christina Plaschka, and I completed my practicum uh, at Island Health in their research and capacity building department. Um, I came across this opportunity after hearing about a pilot project between UVic and Island Health around um, introducing an assistive robot into a long-term care setting. So from that, uh, my practicum turned into research around policies for assistive robots, uh, and I focused on the elderly in healthcare um, to better help inform uh, Island Health going forward if they decide to use these robots more. So why is this important? Um, so the global population is rapidly aging, and it's estimated that the population over 60 years of age will double by the year 2050. Um, so with this increase in senior population, uh, will in it'll result in an increased burden on the healthcare system. Uh, so one potential uh, intervention for this is the use of assistive robots. So these robots have the potential to reduce the uh, impacts on the healthcare system, while at the same time uh, maintaining autonomy of the individual and uh, improving health outcomes. And currently, Canada classifies these robots as medical devices, uh, but the question still remains whether uh, these regulations will be able to account for the rapid rate of technology as it's emerging. Uh, so this picture here is a picture of James the Robotic Butler, which is the robot that's currently uh, being used in the pilot project that Nigel created. Uh, so what is an assistive robot? Uh, so it can be defined as a device that physically assists people with disabilities, and it can also help with um, through non-contact interaction as well. Uh, so for the purpose of my review, I defined it as a device that's at least semi-autonomous and can sense, process information, and perform actions to um, assist elderly individuals in their daily living activities. So this little guy there is Buddy the robot, and he is developed out of France. And so his main functions are he can detect movements um, of a patient uh, to let people know if they fall. He can also provide um, verbal medication reminders and um, act as a mobile telepresence as well. So I decided to do a scoping review, and my main objective was to look at what policies related to the use of robotics in healthcare have been developed. And I also had a secondary objective of looking at whether perceptions or attitudes of the elderly or their healthcare professionals um, could act as a potential barrier when implementing this policy. So that's my beautiful article screening process there. Uh, so for my research, I did two main searches. I first searched uh, five databases using my key search terms and came up with around 214 results and then narrowed that down eventually to 10 sources. And then I conducted a separate gray literature research uh, and that, that came back with 13 sources for a total of 23. Um, and my gray literature consisted mostly of policy papers and government reports. So my results. Um, so common policy strategies around the world included uh, the need for dedicated research on a national level, as well as um, collaboration between nations. There was also a call for creation of a separate legislative body or agency to focus specifically on robots to ensure standards um, for economic and safety were being met. And there was also a call for encouraging public discussion and transparency as well as just broad sweeping recommendations to be proactive about policy making decisions to keep up with technology. So globally, I did note differences between countries on their uh, policy strategies as well. Uh, so for example, uh, the US did have a lot on robots um, and their potential uses, but it mainly focused on things like defense and driverless cars and automation, and didn't really talk about healthcare at all. But uh, Canada, the European Union, Japan, and South Korea did focus more on healthcare, and some uh, specifically on elderly care. So for example, I found Japan definitely had the most detailed policy recommendations. Uh, the report that they put out had specific goals that focused um, 
on nursing and medical fields and had key performance indicators. So for example, they wanted to decrease the use of, um, or sorry, they wanted to uh, decrease um, the occurrence of caregivers suffering backaches to zero by using these robots uh, to assist in transfers of the elderly. So what does this mean for Canada? So I found that Canada does have a pan-Canadian artificial intelligence strategy that was released uh, late in 2018, but it really just focused on talent and research building uh, in the area. Um, so I recommended that Canada needs to create a national policy framework for robotics and healthcare. And I recommended that it follow what the European Union did in 2014, which was a better definition of devices and separating them out from other medical devices as well as promoting independent living through uh, introducing these assistive robots into traditional forms of care and ensuring um, uh, appropriate safety and security measures and tackling privacy issues to ensure that data is um, secure. And then through my review, I also found potential barriers to policy implementation, and I found three main themes. Um, so the first was negative perceptions or attitudes. Uh, a lot of the studies found both positive and negative reactions to use of robots for elderly care, uh, but they also found that direct experience with these robots did result in less ambivalence and promoted acceptance among users. Uh, there was also big privacy concerns around like who has access to the data and what are the robots collecting and where is it stored. Um, so potential solutions are mostly around um, having very clear policy updates um, so that citizens just have transparency and choice over who and what is collecting their data. And lastly, the cost and equitability, equitability concerns were uh, pretty big. There was a big risk of furthering a socioeconomic divide if these robots are released to the public without any support of, sort of government support. Um, so potential solutions range from like insurance policies or tax incentives. And while there's not like one key solution that would fix all of that, uh, it definitely calls for more research in the area. So I also found some cultural differences um, in a few of the reports that I included. Um, they broke that out into like a very generic East versus West mentality um, and claimed that the Western cultures more so than East um, have an inherent fear of robots and linked it to dramatization of scary robots like the Terminator, which they termed the Terminator complex, um, or from people like Elon Musk, like warning the people or warning the public of the dangers of AI. It's called, these can all lead to just a general apprehension of using robots, specifically for uh, elderly care. So while these are like very broad generalizations, I think it just shows that there needs to be further public discussion in the area um, so that citizens can have more like choice and information to make educated decisions for themselves. So my key takeaways are that these assistive robots do have the ability to help reduce the burden on the healthcare system while increasing level of care and quality of life of the elderly population. But for that to happen, there needs to be proactive policy strategies to best support these robots in healthcare. And it'll mean public health officials and policymakers will need to be mindful of all the differences mentioned and to work together to really set standards to avoid any unattended consequences. So limitations to my research, um, I was limited to articles published in English. Um, I'm not multilingual. Um, and because I was doing a global review, there were, were some that were published in uh, languages other than English. Um, and there was also just broad definitions and search terms that encompass the concept of robots. So like robot, robotic, artificial intelligence, smart technology, medical devices, these are all similar terms to talk about the same thing. So I really had to find like key search terms that were common throughout to make sure that uh, I was searching the appropriate uh, information. Whew, and that's it, thank you. <laughs> Oh, sorry, I'm supposed to thank my uh, supervisors, um, Diane uh, Sawchuk and Don Waterhouse and Nigel as well for all your help. Thank you. Good. Are there any questions? Uh, 
Um, that was super interesting. I feel like I'm maybe the like human embodiment of like the Terminator complex. Like, yeah. I am terrified yeah. of this kind of thing, but also like see a benefit to it. And I'm just wondering if you came across any um, like interesting ethical dilemmas um, in your research. Um, just for example, you know the idea of like automated vehicles, right? Like if you're going to protect the person inside instead of the people on the outside, mm -hmm. like, you know, something like that. I'm just wondering if you came across anything that was like particularly interesting to you like that. Oh yeah, there's tons of ethical debates and I didn't really focus too much like in my review on the ethical debates. There's a lot of like, they call it like cold hands versus warm hands, like cold hands of robots versus nurses or something like that. Um, I think the ones, the assistive robots that I focused on, they're not trying to take away jobs or like lessen any sort of human interaction. It's just supposed to augment the level of care so that like family members or nurses or carriers have the time to actually like help the patient or the family member and just spend time with them and like do things like transfers or lifts or like helping them go to the bathroom or do simple things like fetch them a glass of water so that they have like a bit more autonomy and dignity. Yeah. Yeah, I guess <clears throat> my question, I guess, is partly about ethics, but partly also just about human nature. And, and here I will say that I'm thinking about my mother who's in her early 80s and who has a Roomba. And she treats the Roomba almost like a cat. You know, it becomes, it becomes a pet, it becomes a being, it becomes a social entity. And I think I've seen some literature on that as well, where, where particularly in the East, East mm -hmm. quote, quote, where they have more um, anthropomorphized uh, robots, mm -hmm. and, and these become companions. And I guess I'm just wondering about, well, I mean, I'll just, I'm just going to say that and see what your response uh, is, because I think it's fascinating. Yeah. Right? Just so the like, whole human-robot interaction piece. The, like, the cuddly ones that you kind of see are, uh, I didn't include them in my review, but there are like companion robots, and I did separate research um, for Island Health on them. Um, and those ones, I think, yeah, people do tend to associate them more like towards pets and something that they could maybe love. Um, and then there's lots of ethical debates I read too about, especially if you're dealing with dementia patients, like is it ethical to give them a robot which they could like attach feelings to? And is that any different from giving them like a baby that some nursing homes do to like, it calms them down and like, is it deceiving them or is it helping them? There's lots of ethical debates about that. And the same goes with robots and then whether you choose to make them look more human-like or keep them purposely looking like machines so that people don't get attached. There was lots of discussion on that, yeah. yeah. Good, well thank you very much. There you are, you're done. <laughs>